It Happened on the Job, the podcast for relatable conversations with contractors. Sponsored by Goodman Insurance. Welcome to It Happened on the Job. We are episode 37, uh, our podcast for relevant conversations with contractors that hopefully are a little bit entertaining for you as well. <laughs> or relatable or, or relatable, relevant. Or relevant. It just depends on, depends on which day how it you is. Feel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I introduce it differently every time. Yeah, but, you do. I like it. Uh, my name's Mike. That's Brian. Hello. And uh, yeah, today we have David Suter, president of CBSI. How you doing, David? I am doing good for a Monday. It's uh, beautiful in Southern California. Uh, yeah. I was going to say that looks like Hawaii, not Southern California. <laughs> that is true. The background is Hawaii and hopefully The water's too blue. <laughs> well, thanks for jumping on, David. Uh, yeah, if, thanks for joining us. If you could, give us uh, some background on your company and how you got started in the company itself. So our company started by my father, Lou Suter, back in 1986. I was actually, uh, well... We'll, we'll jump forward. And when I was 17 and just out of high school, I got a job in facilities management for a managed healthcare company, um, 1990. In 1997, jump forward, I was ready to leave that business. And my father had this project management business. I'd been a facility manager. And so he said, hey, why don't you come join the family business? It's kind of the same line of things, project management, construction management, relocation planning. And I thought it was a great idea. The company that I worked for had been taken over by a management style that was not great. And and so it was time to move on. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take two weeks off and, um, you know, get started with my father's company. And Friday afternoon, I was about an hour away from leaving. And he called me and said, hey, we got this brand new client. I need you here 7 a.m. Monday morning. So that's how my (laughs) journey at CBSI started back in. Didn't even get vacation to start, huh? Yeah. Which is why he wants Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> well, so cool. yeah, what do you guys do there? Just uh, maybe a little bit more in depth about what you guys do. So we are construction management, um, project management, and relocation planning. So it's a wide variety. Uh, again, my background in facilities management, my father's background in construction and engineering through a, a hotel business for 25 years prior to CBSI. Um, So we have clients that we manage their construction projects, and typically we are an extension of a facilities team or an operations team that either does not have the experience or has more projects than they can manage themselves, and they reach out to us, and and we'll jump in and manage it for them. But we also do a lot of relocation planning for corporations that are expanding or uh, right-sizing, as we would call it, uh, moving to a new building and all the planning that goes along with that. Also, a lot of that in the um, educational, higher educational um, realm. We've, we've done a lot of work with higher education over this last 20 years. And that's really the realm of our businesses, construction management and relocation planning. Okay. So are you guys being hired more by the general contractor on a project or by the owner slash developer to make sure that things are done correctly throughout the entire project? Yeah, we're typically hired directly by the clients. Um, okay. We actually are on a teaming agreement with uh, Sunt Construction right now uh, for a huge project at the San Diego International Airport that we're actually doing the last, you know, it's been going on for the last two and a half years. And on Friday, we actually started the first uh, relocations of that team. So this is the first time we've worked under a general contractor. Typically, uh, we work directly for the client, whoever that client may be. Okay. So doing things like, you know, like you said, like the facilities management, make sure that from a safety and and operations and everything standpoint, all that stuff is in line. Well, when it comes to the moves, um, you know, typically if someone's moving into a new building, there's a lot of pieces and parts that go along with that. Right. um, The TI and everything else. Yeah. Right. The TI. And sometimes we're involved in that. Sometimes we're not. You know, sometimes they're, they're managing that separately and we're just in there to do the actual relocation planning. And the difference with us is there's a lot of companies that do relocation planning. Back when we started 34 years ago, there was only really two companies in San Diego that did relocation planning. And now just about everybody and their brother does it. But I think the difference with us is we really dive into the human factor. And we go into a client and and say they got 500 people to move and they're like, oh, you know, we have 500 butts, you know, butts and boxes to, to move. And it's like, no, these are people we're talking about. And we yeah. kind of explain the human factor and why 
how important it is to get your people involved that they're not just a butt in a seat with their boxes to move to a new facility and really break out the human element and get them involved and why, again, it's important to really understand what people are going through on a relocation. And that's a whole rabbit hole that we can go yeah, down. for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that, that's really the aspect of uh, what we get involved in doing. Wow. So from a, from a, I guess, employee standpoint, do you guys have a labor force as well? Or is it mainly just the, the planning and, and uh, systems that you guys provide? So there's 10 of us and we're all on the project management side of things. Okay. We don't have a labor force. We do have a general contractor's license, which we've had since the business started, but we've never performed as a general contractor. Mm-hmm. You know, typically like in some of these moves with some of the clients we have, the community college districts, we've been asked to actually have the mover underneath us. So they report to us and it's one contract to the district. Yeah. So in that aspect, there would be a labor force, but it's a whole <laughs> different company that we're subcontracting right. to. Right. But typically for us, it's just project management. And so when you guys are getting brought in by your client, are they supplying you, since you're managing that entire project, I'm assuming from a labor standpoint as well, are they, are they supplying the labor as well? Are you bringing in uh, companies that you've worked with before in the past? So there's a handful of uh, moving companies there in Southern California that we've been working with for the last few decades that will recommend. Now, if it's on a college project or a municipality, um, one of the other projects we're working with, it's low bid. So whoever gets the low bid gets the project and that's yeah. got a whole yeah. other realm for itself too. I was going to say, I'm sure you've got, got quite a few <laughs> stories going down that rabbit hole as well. Oh my. I'm manage that. Yeah. Um, but typically what we'll do is we'll come in for a client and we'll write the full RFP. We will vet whatever the move has, the aspect of the move has, and we will vet it and write a very detailed scope of work, help them bid it out, help them select whether it's low bid or not, go through all that paperwork, insurance, make sure the contracts are in place, and then manage the mover all the way through from day one until the people move in and, and you know, beyond. Right, right. Yeah. How, how about your, your team of, you said, what, eight to 10 people, I think, that are with you right now, are they, have they been around a while? Uh, are they long-term employees or is, is, I'm assuming there's probably a process to hiring them as well. So maybe if you can unpack that a little bit in terms of how you bring them on and, uh, and some of the culture within the company itself. Yeah. You know what? Culture is a huge part in, in you know, going back and, and let me reverse a little bit to show you where we're at right now. Coming into the business that first day, you know, jumping into that project, that is a client that we still have t- today. Oh, wow. You know, that, it's been 22 years mm-hmm. and that client that I started with that first day is still one of our clients. And the reason for that is because of the relationships that we have, the trust that we build, and people know that we're going to go the extra mile. So we have long-term clients and we have long-term employees. Obviously, my, my dad's been in the business for uh, 34 years. I'm on my 22nd year. We've been We've owned the company together since 2004. And then my wife, Sarah, she came on about two and a half years ago to really help bring the culture in. Um, She came from higher education, uh, 15 years of higher education, and is really good at strategy and team building. And it was something that we needed to bring in and do better as as a company. So she's been with us two and a half years. Greg, my, you know, brother that I never had. Um, he's, he's been with us for 17 years, almost 18 years, wow. but I worked with him where I came from at the old, uh, when I was a facility manager, he came from there. So he's been with us for a long time. And then a couple others, you know, anywhere from five to 12 years at this point. So wow. we do have some long-term, um, there have some been some shorter term and yeah. some bad decisions made along the way on having a need to fill a seat to manage a project and looking past what the culture means and it biting us. I was going to say that that almost never works out. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. So you feel like, you feel like it should be a roulette at some point you should hit one. Right. But uh, it just, (laughs) it almost never works out like that. Right. (laughs) It does. And, and, you know, I I would say for the most part, we've had some pretty long-term employees and some have moved on because they, they are young and, you know, the younger generation these days don't stay on jobs very long. They're ready to move on and build their career, and that's fine. And we've also had people that were with us 15 years and retired. And, and one of that aspects was we had someone that was doing awesome, just a great, great guy. His name was Dale. And uh, 
he left us to go retire to be with the grandkids in North Carolina. And I don't blame him a bit. I, I hold it against him, but I don't blame him. <laughs> um, and he was managing a lot of high end projects for us. And he gave us three weeks and to get the right person in three weeks, hey. it, it, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And so we hired a lady that was, had the experience on, on managing construction projects, but we were a little hesitant on the personality and honestly, within a month of her being there, we lost the entire everything. <laughs> it's because of making the mistake of hiring someone that doesn't fit our culture. So for us, culture is very important. And we're like a family. You know, we, we treat our employees like a family. And this is something that Sarah and I have really worked on over the last two and a half years and, and beyond because we were talking about leadership and, you know, been on our leadership journey side by side for the last 10 years um, of our marriage, as she was working in higher education, I was working at CBSI. And how do we do better? Because, you know, for us, the people matter. And, you know, there's so many, there's so many managers out there that have made their way up to the top, either by default, because they've been with a company a long time, and they keep being promoted. Yeah. And they're good at managing, but they're not good at leading. And there's a big difference between being a good manager of a system or a project and leading people. Yep. And so we wanted to change our culture to say, you know what, we want to be leaders that people want to follow. And so we've been working on that and building our culture up and creating this family environment that our staff know that we can sit around our table. Well, you know, three months ago when we were allowed to sit together around right. our table yeah. <laughs> and have a conversation that, you know, we celebrated together, we cried together, we bounced things off each other because there's that ultimate amount of trust going on within our company. So, you know, a few years ago, we were 13 staff and now we're down to 10 and we're doing more business now. I mean, incredibly more business now than we were doing then because of the cross training, the trust, the, the, the sense of everyone in our team says, you know what, whatever you need, I'm going to jump in. I'm, I'm all in, whatever you need, let's do it. And, so it, it, our culture has changed with that trust factor in knowing that our staff really know that they're cared for, that, you know, they could probably get offered more money, but I don't think they would move because they know they have a solid place here yeah. that people want to be. And I, I, I got to be honest, it's going to be tough when it comes time to hire that next person yeah. to spend the time to make sure we get the right culture fit. Yeah, well, it's like it's like trying to find another brother, right? It, it, yeah. if somebody moves on, you're like, I, I don't know how we could fill that void that has been left. You know, like Dale, for instance, who's go, who's gone out to North Carolina is, is with and has to do that. I understand that with grandkids, but how do you replace that? Man, uh, I, that's I mean, re, you really can't, right? You just have to find somebody that. <laughs> which is, that's the difficult part. You have yeah. to find somebody that can actually fit that. Yeah, role. and I, I would say now it, it might even be a better time because there have been so many layoffs. And yeah. there's, probably, there's probably better talent out there now than there has been in right. the last 10 years. So there's that going on. And, you know, the, the way that we're moving our business and trying to grow our business, um, we're going to be looking. So, you know, I, I, I'm excited to hear that not how we got to the ta available talent market, but that the talent market is there. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and hopefully it's there, right? I, I, I have a, I, we get a sense sometimes we've, we've talked to a couple of people that have said that it's not there yet. That they're hoping at some point in the next, in the, in the near future, it's going to be there because people are pretty comfortable staying at home right now and, and, uh, collecting those unemployment checks. So. Which is probably not the person that you want. Yeah. 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 So hopefully there's can, no yeah. question. And yeah. I've seen a lot of that too. And I, I don't want the person who's, who's comfortable at home yeah. collecting Yep. Tech because they're making more. I just, that's not the mindset that would fit in with yep. uh, this business. Yeah. 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 I, I think that would speak to an integrity, you know, character, Yeah, which is what we're talking about, right? That's the type of person that you want to fill that role. It's somebody that you could trust, that you love, that you could, you know, that you could trust that they're going to get something done when they say they're going to do it. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. And for us, you know, we don't have necessarily, you get two weeks of vacation. It's, we trust you. We know you're going to get the job done. If you need to take a day off because you're burnt out, take the day off, yeah. you know, you know, let us know. And if there's, <laughs> yeah, happen, right, right. you know, but that's the honest conversations and in, in the relationships we have. And, and so that, that's the culture that CBSI has and it brings. And honestly, 
the last few interviews that we've been on against some of our competition, we've won because of our culture and what we offer to the human factor of things. Mm-hmm. It's not just about business. Hey, yeah, we're the best. We, you know, have a resume of 30 years of completing the similar projects. No, let's talk about what you're yeah, going to say, what, what especially, yeah. yeah, especially now, I, I feel like there's so many layers to bus- decisions that are made in business, right? I mean, 15, 20 years ago, it was, can you do the job? Can you do it at this price? You get the job. But just with that overexposure culture that we have right now of everybody seeing everything and, and knowing everything, there's a lot more that goes into a lot of decision-making process. So when you're able to portray how you treat your people and how your business runs and how, you, you know, that culture that you have internally, mm-hmm. um, I think that's, that, that translates well and, and, and people can see that and that goes into that decision-making process quite often nowadays. Yeah, and it, it, we've not always been that way. I mean, I came from the background of project management. Again, so was my father. So we know how, how to manage projects. And before my motto was, you know, follow me, watch how I'm doing things, do them the way I do them, and you'll be successful. Yeah. Not really thinking about that every person's a little bit different. And I had to figure out you know, 10 years ago that I don't do the same thing the same way my father does, even though he's taught this is the way to do it. I finally had to realize that, man, doing it your way works, but that's not the comfortable way for me to do it. And and so I had to break away from that that mold and, and realize that I'm my own person and our pe- every person's a little bit different and approaches thing a little bit different. So if you give them these guidelines of what the expectations are and let them figure it out your way and, you know, you have to inspect what you expect and make sure you're following up, but, you know, give people their own way on, on how they can complete tasks and, and not just necessarily set down ABC. Right. Time. Right. Oh. So speak to, you said you went from being a manager to a, to a leader, speak to a couple of the, of the conscious decisions that you had to make in, in that transition uh, that may have been a little difficult or that, you know, that you're still kind of working on. Well, I I will tell you this. Um, I spent over 10 years working at a community college district during a construction bond program. And I was their, I guess, facilities manager because they didn't have one. And I kind of fit that that role because that was my experience. So five years, I was working on just this bond as a facility manager. We, you know, doubled the, the, the square footage of this college campus. And they got to a point in 2008 remember 2008, got to a point in 2008, and they said, hey, can you help us hire a director of facilities? I'm like, sure, I'll help you do that. So, I mean, we, we went across the nation, and we interviewed, flew these people in and interviewed them and uh, found one and hired him. They hired him in June of 2008. And again, this bond program still going on. I got three people working under me from my company, managing projects, doing relocations as we're building these two campuses up. I was working at one, but we were working on projects on both. And in November, at the end of November, 2008, they said, okay, you've done a great job on handing, you know, the, the rollover to the director of facilities. Um, we're done. We, we're not going to need you going into 2009. And I did not see that coming. I oh. thought I was going to be at that college campus man- managing projects for the next five or six years. And so by the end of the year, it was, you know, you're done here. Your, your guy, your team is still working on projects, but your role is done. And so I had to humbly go into 2009 where no one's hiring anybody for doing anything because the economy's taking and figure out, figure myself out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was vice president of the company at the time. My father was president. So I spent that first six months of 2009 rebranding the company um, you know, logos and social media and all those things and, and, and spent some time saying, what does leadership look like? What, what do I, how do I need to become a better leader now that I can't have the excuse of I'm just managing projects and I actually have to run a company? What does that look like? So I, you know, the John Maxwell's and the Jim Collins and the Coveys and all these great authors that I just dove into to figure out what does it look like to, to be a leader and not be just a manager of projects and I never thought about it before. Yeah, I had great relationships with our staff, but I really never, I would say, dug into who they are and, you know, spent the time with them, getting to know them a little bit better on a personal Mm -hmm. level. And so that really changed in 2009. And we started to rebrand the company. And I started to focus more on leadership instead of just management. Yeah. So so it sounds like a big step to that was understanding your people and, and, and getting to know them a little bit more. 
Yeah, uh, really, uh, again, I had the mentality of follow me, I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> right. Instead of, you know, what are the thing? what are your passions? And that's a question we ask our, our staff all the time. This is something I learned from my wife, you know, asking the people, what are your passions? What are the things that you want to do? Is the position that you're in, is, is that where you want to continue to go? Or do you have other aspirations and really spending the time saying, okay, if you're a project coordinator, do you want to be a project manager? Or do you want to be something completely different and really helping them get to the goals they want to be in, uh, whether that be new certifications or going back to school or changing their, you know, th- their job completely. Our office manager, Sandy, came in, used to be in construction management, but uh, quit when her kids were young to be a mom for a while and came back into the industry and has been our office manager and labor compliance and invoice and all that. But she had a true passion to get back in in the field in these last couple of years. She's back in the field and she loves it. She feels like, you know, she's she's doing what she was meant to do. And everyone has a story and everyone has um, a reason why they're at. But really spending the time understanding your people and understanding what their passion is and letting them follow that and helping them get there. And, you know, if they're again, we can go back to culture. And if they're not a great culture fit for your company, you share them with the competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a big, big piece of that, that a lot of people uh, kind of have to, a lot of potential leaders, right? Maybe managers of people need to wrap their head around is that you're going to add, you have to ask these questions without the fear of whatever the answer might be. Because I mean, take your, your office manager, for example, I mean, you, you, you're having these conversations with her and then you realize she wants to be in the field. That may not have been, it may have, may have been the perfect fit for you guys at the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you're losing somebody who you've trained to be in one position, but you know that she could be doing, I don't want to say a better job, but you know, maybe, you know, a little bit more for you guys or, or being able to give you guys a little bit more in the field. And, and now you've got to find a way to replace her obviously in the, in the office. So it's not only asking those questions, but not being fearful of the responses knowing that it's going to take some work on your end. Yeah. And I tell you what, um, we, we've had a couple times where maybe shorter term uh, staff for us, say three to five years, have actually left us to go to one of our clients. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that sucks. Yep. But, and before it was like, you know, we got to write some clauses in our contracts that say you can't leave us and you can't go to our clients, blah, blah, blah. And now we've completely changed that. It's like, if your passion is not here, let us help you find your passion. And, you know, my, my father doesn't agree with that mentality, <laughs> but Sarah and I do that if someone's passion is not with us or if someone's passion is with doing something else then help them find that. We want people that have the passion to do what we're doing in whatever their role may be, project coordinator to senior project manager. We want them to live their best life. And if it's not with us, that's great. But if it is, tell us what we can do to help you be better. And, you know, as a leader, that's one of my questions of what can I do to make you more successful? Is it a computer? Is it, you know, some training? Is it, you know, a different work schedule? Let's just talk about it and find out what the things are that you're passionate about and what you need to be successful. And it's completely changed my realm of things of how I lead and how I interact with our staff. And again, my wife, Sarah, who is our, our vice president and Sarah and I pretty much run the business on, on a day-to-day basis. We're, we're doing the, the tactical planning, the strategic planning for the long-term and the short-term and the day-to-day operations. My father, who has been in the business a long time, he just wants to manage projects and he loves managing projects and he's managing projects. He's part of the end decisions, but the day-to-day is Sarah and I really figuring out. Yeah. And, you know, we, it, it's interesting and this relates because I know you guys want to talk a little bit about covid we planned at the end of last year to prepare for this year as, you know, clients jam to get as much project done as they can at the end of last year. And it's a slow start to get projects assigned for the beginning of the next year. So for 2020, we planned that out a little bit better. Who knew this yeah. whole COVID thing yeah, was right? going to happen? That was and, and whatnot. But, it's, but having that made is. those decisions, again, strategic planning early on, we set ourselves up to be in a better position to um, make our way through this, this uh, whole COVID thing and told our staff from the beginning, Hey, we're good. We're, we got, you know, several months worth of reserves, not to panic. We'll readjust. We'll figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, overnight pretty much said, okay, you guys are working from home. 
pick up your stuff. Everyone's already got a laptop, so it wasn't a big of an adjustment. And within 24 hours, we had our staff uh, working from home and figured out this whole Zoom and Teams and yeah. uh, got everybody back up and running <laughs> and have a Zoom meeting every morning at 8 a.m. to get on the same page and, and make sure that the business is continuing. And fortunately, being in the construction industry, um, being an essential worker, we, we were shut down for a day when the governor said everything stops. And then <laughs> by the next morning said, oh, yeah, a few things can keep going. Just so kidding. <laughs> we, yeah, shut down that Friday and back to work on uh, Monday. So yeah. um, we've been able to uh, keep things moving pretty well during this uh, whole COVID experiment or experience. I don't know. There's a lot of different things. We've, we've, we've heard several. Yeah. We've been referring it to a, a somebody, Social somebody, experiment. yeah. Somebody told us once and Kevin we've, Hempel, yeah. we've yeah. stolen it, but they, yeah. somebody once called it a, a social experiment. Yeah. yeah. I would say. <laughs> yeah. No. So that's, that's great. It's so funny. I mean, we, we were almost the same way here. I mean, it was, it was literally overnight. Everybody just, all right, pack your stuff up. Make sure you got an internet yeah, connection an hour, at home. And, I think, yeah, yeah. It was very, it felt very apocalyptic, very yeah. strange. Yeah. But uh, luckily we're all back. You guys, so have you guys brought everybody back in the office now? Somewhat. So what we did, and we actually celebrated, um, we have two interns. One is our 17-year-old son who is a junior. And one of the other one is a senior who didn't really get to graduate, didn't get to finish yeah. his senior year. So we brought everyone back together two Fridays ago into the office, brought some lunch in. Uh, everyone came in with masks and was kind of social distancing and then decided, you know what, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what we think about it, but <laughs> everybody's like, we're, we're probably off. in line with you. So it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mask off. We're good. And we yeah. had a great time celebrating. We get, we gave him a thousand dollar scholarship check to go to San Jose state from home starting, unfortunately. Right. But um, we yeah. got back together. And, and at that point we said, look, the office is open. If you want to come in and work, go for it. You know, some of us are on project sites. I'm sitting on a construction site right now, which is why the internet connection wasn't great. And, and so if, if a couple of people want to be in the office, we move things around a little bit and we have a big enough open space in our, in our office that people can come in and work together, um, but still be the required social distance. So we right. have all the signage up and everything. So the office is open. People are working there, and um, we're just not all there at at one given time, which we never really were. So it's okay. Yeah, I was going to say. So I mean, I would imagine your business, and especially the size of your business, would probably lend itself to probably continue that way into the future, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine. I guess I don't want to say I can't imagine because it's not my business; it's yours. But I would, I would, I would assume that as long as everybody's working efficiently, that it might just kind of stay that way in perpetuity. Is that kind of what your yeah, guys' the thought is? Thing is we've only had an office space for about five years. Yeah. So the, the business was out of my father's house and he still has his office there. And there's another office that no one sat in for the last five years, but we've been on project sites. I was at that community college for over 10 years. We, yeah. You know, I had three or four people <clears throat> there and you know, our other clients, we, we had offices there, so we didn't need one until about five years ago when part of the culture changes, I want a home base. That's not mm -hmm. a house. Right. I don't want, our staff to have to walk past people's bedrooms to get to an office. So we got an office space and it's been awesome. That's cool. So we, we, from a, from a workflow standpoint, do your, do your project managers, are they, do they have the bandwidth or the capacity to manage more than one project at a time? Or, or I mean, not that they as, as humans or employees couldn't, but I, I more mean like, how do you, yeah, yeah. Does, do you guys just demand it that they're only doing one at a time? Is that how you guys work it out or? No, not at all. Um, our, our one, so the, the client I'm talking about is SD Genie. They've been, okay. they're the client yeah, yeah. that I jumped in and they've been a client for over 20 years. So Ron, who is managing those projects, we have 31 projects assigned to us right now. Wow. Um, active under construction are about six, but there's closeout and there's planning. So that's multiple projects for a, a person plus an assistant project manager right. and a project coordinator. Um, and me jumping in in leadership and my father managing his own set of SDG &E projects himself. So um, we all are mul managing multiple projects. I'm jumping in and out. We have this $9 million project out at uh, Santee Lakes, which is in uh, San Diego at a park mm -hmm. that Sandy is managing, but I'm jumping in a couple days a week and jumping out and we're, I'm down at the airport. I was down at the airport on Saturday. Um, Sarah and our other senior PM, Greg, are managing that huge project. So 
we, like I said, we cross um, train and anybody can jump on any project at any given time when the need is because, you know, God willing, no one gets sick of COVID and no one has yet. But if it were to happen, we have backup and any one yeah. of our people can jump in and, and not skip a beat. So what's, what's, what are some of the, the day-to-day hurdles that your project managers kind of have to get through or, 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 you know, the challenges they face on a day-to-day that are required of them, for, of your clients? You know, COVID has changed that hugely. Like, yeah, I would imagine there's probably a few more hurdles to get over now. But <laughs> Well, yeah, because even them, they have people that are working from home. So the coordination effort and it has changed. But on some of the sites we go to there, you know, there's three or three to five questions plus a temperature check. Yep. Um, same thing down at the airport. And, you know, honestly, for those relocations, we're, move, we're it's a very large move that we're doing at the airport. It's their whole facilities management department moving into this massive new admin building and warehouse facility, which Sun Construction did an awesome job on it. It's a beautiful place. But typically on something like this, we have 25 to 40 movers on any given day to jump on and just handle these things. And we had, number one, they had to postpone the move 60 days because the airport themselves had to figure themselves out. I mean, think right. of their business. Their yeah. business has dropped considerably as far as people flying. So they've had adjusted their facility management staff. Half is working from home. So we postponed that 60 days. But now we're to a point where, you know, with the governor saying no more than 10 people gathered together, now we're doing groups of movers of 10 where we were having 40 to do. So it has completely changed how we've had to schedule the moves and the time frame and the hours and all those things. So uh, we've had two months to readjust. And like I said, we started this move last Friday on the first phase and it's, they're going full speed for the next five weeks trying to make up time and get this thing done. So yeah, it's been considerable of not only are you wearing PPE, well, construction PPE, hard hat, right, vest, right. boots, gloves. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. you got to wear a mask. Yeah. 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 And, and they're, they're no joke. Sunt, Sunt is no joke as far as they got the PPE lawman out there that's, uh, that's yeah. you know, on you if you don't have your gloves on or if you don't have the face mask on. And it's hard working eight to ten hours with that face mask on. Oh, I imagine, yeah. And trying to breathe normally. So, yeah, we've had to adjust a lot. And, um, you know, we put it on the mover. What it, it's, the, the, it's their, you know, it's their company. It's their process. What is your process for PPE and in, in COVID-19. So it's been a huge adjustment on the project sites, on our construction sites, mm-hmm. uh, same thing. And a lot of these, it's almost impossible for six foot distancing, not only between movers, but construction guys. I mean, try pouring concrete on a huge slab or a retaining wall and keeping six foot distance between the guys doing the work. It's just impossible. Yeah. And so it's more of keeping the same groups of people together that work together on a daily basis and do the temperature check and you know, the three to five questions, depending on who the company is and what their protocol is. Uh, but it's changed things considerably of having to fit within the protocol, but still get the job done. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so from the management side, I mean, obviously you're speaking to some of those, those new guidelines and the new kind of you know, regulations and everything else that you have to uh, have to follow. I'd have to imagine from the, you know, for the, you know, since it started to, you know, a certain period of time a few months there was some adjustment but do you see it getting back to a point where you can you've you guys have are you getting to a point i guess my question is are you getting to a point now where you've streamlined some of that stuff so some of these newer projects that are just getting started that maybe don't have to transition that you can start them this way uh are are going to be a little bit more streamlined as you're moving forward or is it still just gonna be a pain we are we are and you know every day is learning it's trying to figure this thing out because it changes daily and they're starting to let things up and you know, some things are acceptable and some things are not. And honestly, it's the clients. Some clients are like super, super strict for liability and others are like, we're not wearing masks. And, yeah. you know, there's a whole, again, another rabbit hole to go down. <laughs> of, is it going to get strict again in middle of October for, you know, political reasons right, and right. that whole thing? Right. But yeah, we're, we're, we're streamlining and we're figuring out how to do things a little bit differently going into the next move. We'll, we'll know, you know, try planning a move for six to eight months of, okay, we're going to have 40 guys on site. And then 
a week before the move is supposed to start is when everything went kibosh and had a change and delay. And now you got to come back with groups of 10. So yeah, we've learned a lot. We, we know what we can do and, and what we can't do. And for now, um, as they ease things up, it's been a little bit easier to prepare on what it truly means to have only 10 people in, in a group. So right. instead of having a group of 10 guys that have to, you know, pack, load the truck, unload the truck, unpack, you can have 10 guys that can pack a truck, a driver that moves it over and 10 guys that can un- un- unpack a truck with yeah, some so it's just more reor- re- reorganization of the labor rather than, than yeah. uh, limiting mm-hmm. it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and kind of maybe piggybacking off that when you and Sarah are kind of going over some of your tactical planning, uh, whether it's short term or long term, uh, I got to imagine that there's issues that kind of <laughs> maybe outside of COVID, but well, you can't really say that anymore because yeah. that it's kind of reality know. now. Unfortunately. New, new, new but, normal. Yeah. What are, what are yeah. some of the strategies that you guys utilize together as a management team to go through difficult decisions, whether it's, you know, financial or employee related or, you know, you name it. What, what are some of those uh, processes that you guys use? Um, you know, I'm, I'm involved in this group called Convene. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. Jordan. Yeah, Jordan, our, yeah. one of our owners yeah. here is in it as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, our, our Convene group that I've been involved for the last year, which has been great, they <laughs> our, our, our uh, group leader, his name's Werner, he uh, sent out this um, forecast. And, you know, we've been using a couple different things, five-year plan, two-year plan, to try to project out what the business looks like. But he gave us more of a tactical plan of what does five years look like? What does the next 90 days look like? You know, it's got a SWOT analysis, all those things. And mm-hmm. and so I, I put this thing together about a year ago and, and laid it out. And, and one of the things that I think is forgotten a lot as we're going through in business is the whole back page was, what are your wins from last year? And to write down what my wins were from last year was really had me reflect on man, we, we accomplished a lot. And I think we forget that if we don't take the time to journal it or reflect or have some mechanism to uh, understand where we came from and where we are now. And that really helps us project things forward. So again, we're looking at what does the next five years look like? Where do we want to be as a business? What are the things that are going to happen in the next 90 days? And you know th- that could be strategic things, financial things, and really spending time and going back on a monthly basis you know, I, I, I put this thing together myself as part of the group, but I said, hey, Sarah, what do you think of this? And she helped me, you know, finish filling some of the blanks that I wasn't thinking of. Um, so really sticking to that and going back on at least a monthly basis. And, you know, one of the things that uh, we do, and she is so much better at it than I am, is like, we need to take a break. We need to take a day away and just talk about the business, not about the details of a project, not about necessarily a person or a project manager, but let's talk about the business and let's talk about what do we want to do over the next year or the next five years, the next 90 days, and really take that time out going into the day with a fire hose and a to-do list. And I'm just going to fight the fire and I'm going to check the box on the to-do list and I'm go, go, go. And she's like, pump the brakes. And she did that to me a couple of weeks ago. She's like, you're not even acting and react, you're reacting more than you're responding to your clients and your projects. And you need to pump the brakes because the stress is high and you just need to take a time off. And so I took a couple of days off and really t- spent time reflecting, not only hanging out with our three teenage boys, but spending some time on reflecting of the business and what we really want. Cause man, it, 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 those that don't do that, you just get stuck in the day to day to day to day. And mm-hmm. you know, what's the next to do list for today. So really spending the time to stop and reflect And taking the time away, turning off the phone, and maybe it's just that whole what you guys have, uh, a a piece of paper and a pen and writing things down (laughs) instead of, you know, getting distracted by the emails that are coming in that, you know, someone's emergency has to be dealt with right then. So that's just a high recommendation of something that I've had to do to stop and reflect to really plan out what the future looks like. Well, it's important too. I mean, especially if you're, you're deliberately doing it on a, on a, on a, on some sort of schedule on some level, just because you can, you can, even if you set that plan, that two year plan, that five year plan, whatever it is, even the 90 day one, when you, like you said, when you go in there with a fire hose and you're just putting out fires, you, you kind of get lost yeah. Yeah. and uh, yeah. you, you, you don't realize how far you've gotten off track or how far you've 
veered away from that plan that was supposed to get to you to where you wanted to be in 90 days or two years or five years. Yeah. You know, when you're just putting out fires like that. So yeah. I think that's, that's, that's smart to. Yeah. yeah you're, you're, yeah. You're not going to go insane. You're, you're creating for yourself some room for sanity, I yeah. think. And you had, I had, you have a podcast, I think it's called yeah. lead with coffee and that's with your wife, yep. Sarah. And I, I listened to your first episode and I think you had mentioned that in your first, or she had mentioned that, I think probably that particular, uh, it was like right after Memorial Day, I want to say that I, that I had heard it. So yeah, I, I remember hearing that and thinking, I don't remember the last time I've actually done that, right? Because usually you get to the office, you're sitting down, you got your cup of coffee and I start digging through, okay, what are all the things that I got to do? What are the emergencies that I have to handle and the most immediate, you know? What are the things I could prioritize towards later in the day? And, and before you know it, you're at the end of the day going, you know, there have been days where my wife's like, hey, so how was your day? I'm like, ah, oh, God. I mean, I got away from me, right? I didn't have the time to actually sit down yep. and decompress. And, and day after day after day after day, month after month, I could see that. Yeah, it's, that's huge. Way to go, Sarah, right? Yeah, and... and- so, yeah. So for us being a married couple running a business together, yeah. there is no time off. It's 24 <laughs> seven of business. So we, we have to, we have to pause and work on the marriage mm-hmm. and spend time on the marriage and spend time with our teenage kids, which is a whole other thing because, you know, now that school is out officially of last week, but we had three kids working on school stuff from home and, yeah. you know, dealing with that. So yeah. it's been very interesting, but she is so good at like, we need to turn it off and just go, go to the beach and, you know, go to Hawaii, whatever, to, to reflect and and spend time together to, to build, to build the marriage. Because, you know, if we're just going to be partners in a business, that's not long-term planning. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hopefully half of that, hopefully half of that equation is long-term, right? (laughs) Well, it is with the marriage. I mean, without, you know, spending time on the marriage and just talking about business, it isn't going to, that's not happy wife, happy life, or happy spouse, happy house. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so true. So, what is what does the future look like for you guys? Where I mean, are you, are you comfortable with the the volume uh, of uh, of stuff you guys manage now, or is there are there different verticals? Because it sounds like the the schoolwork is is pretty pretty hefty for you guys. But is are there different verticals you're looking to get into, or? Yeah, you know, the the last few years we actually jumped back into more of the corporate relocation. And we, you know, we interviewed for four and got four against the competition that has been doing corporate relocations, you know, all the way through. We jumped back just because God had put that on my heart going, you know, I I think we're going to be really good here because culture and people are such a big deal. We were very successful on the college higher education stuff, but we want to get back into corporate. So we've had some, you know, large moves from, you know, a hundred to a thousand people over these last couple of years. And then they've been great. But on the other hand, not to go too far off track, there was one that we were awarded and we are fiercely loyal to our staff. And we didn't like what we were hearing from them on a cultural basis and how our staff were being talked to. And we actually said, you know what, we, we decided before we actually start that we don't want this because we don't want where this is going to go. And, and it was, it was unfortunate. And this was a huge, huge business move for us, you know, several hundred thousand dollars of business that we hit pause on because we thought it was going to go down such a a bad road. Um, So that's a hard business decision that we made, but going back into the corporate relocations and and there's a lot going on um, here in San Diego and Southern California, and we're going to continue to pursue that. Uh, We like the construction management. We do long-term projects with uh, municipalities and that's great, but we really think that the corporate market, and now it's going to be right sizing because half the people, the thousand people we moved last year, I almost back guarantee into a 500 you know, people yep. are going to go back into that office. Yeah, so that's, so that's it, literally where I was going to go with that next is, you know, I'm sure you've done a lot more forecasting and looking into this kind of stuff than we have, obviously. But I have to imagine that, like you, literally, just like you said, a lot of those people that that moved into bigger buildings are going to probably be downsizing in the near future just because they realize they don't need it anymore. Yeah, so they they have to right size now, and people that had a lease up that thought that they were going to you know, move to a new location to get more room are thinking, oh, maybe we're going to TIR space and, you know, renew the lease, or maybe 
we're going to go into a smaller space. So that's where we're jumping in. And we have a great marketing person and uh, a business development person that we've contracted with that is like on it. And she I was going to say that's, that's a huge, it. huge sector to start getting into because <laughs> Oh, it, uh, it, it really yeah. is. So, yeah, yeah we, we feel comfortable. We feel good with <clears throat> the way that that's going. So any, anyways, yeah, that, that, that's a big realm. And it's the whole right sizing. It's not expanding. It's not contracting. It's right sizing because every company is different. And every company is going through something different right now. Can, and can you trademark that? I feel like you need to trademark that. We should probably. I was going to say, I haven't heard that, but that's, that's a good one. You just, you just yeah, well, we are, we're going to start marketing with that piece of it. So anyways, yeah. that, that's where the business is going. We feel, we feel real comfortable with it. And uh, we feel like we have a lot to offer with, uh, in, in that realm. Very cool. That's, no, awesome. that's awesome. Well, Hey David, we, we don't want to take too much more of your time today, but uh, it sounds like you're on the job site right now, but if you could maybe just kind of give us a, a plug and tell, tell the people where to find you guys, uh, whether it's social media or, uh, or the interwebs. I will do. Is there time for a funny story? Oh, oh, yeah. You got, you got one? We love those. Oh, yeah, man, bring it on. Them. Okay. So um, back to... 2015, 2016, uh, we were doing a library move, 750,000 volumes of books. Jeez. And it was two libraries for a city that we had to, man- we had to plan and manage to move out so both buildings could be gutted and remodeled. So items were going on what they call, the movers call library carts, which is just shelves of yeah. Um, you know, yeah. parts were shelves, storing them for six months, and then six months later, bringing them back in and putting them back in the correct location, which was a completely different layout from what it was before because they remodeled. <laughs> well, of course, and that would be too easy that for it to go back logical. the same way. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so, anyways, we have this thing dialed in perfectly, um, ready to go. So we moved out of the first one. We we phased this. We moved out of the first one. Six months go by. And we come back and we are um, putting back together. We're like 90% done with the move back in. And this was a company called CNM Relocation, Mick Mahaffey, that we've been working with for decades doing this. And we get about, um, we're working on one of the last sections, which is the genealogy, which for this city, the genealogy is like where everyone goes to find genealogy. It's, a, it's like, you know, it, their, it is the place. their prized possession. We get about 75% with books back on racks. And they come back and said, it's all out of order. Every, all these books are out of order. We're like, whoa, what are you talking about? It's exactly how we planned it. The labels are perfect. We, you know, and, and they were freaking out. We had the city manager. We had all kinds of people there going, what did you guys do? What's the problem? So I called Mick and said, I need like 10 guys here right now to figure this thing out, to get this thing reloaded. And so they spent the you know next eight hours unloading everything and putting everything, putting everything back and whatnot. So we got it fixed. I was pissed because I'm like, we had this thing dialed in. We knew yeah, what this happened? thing was right. So we find out, I don't know if it was a week or two later, the, um, the city project manager came back and said, hey, I, I just want to let you know, we found out that that last Friday that we did the packing in the genealogy area, there was a disgruntled employee who it was their last day and Shut before up. we started packing that day, they moved all the labels around. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So they, they had it on they had it on camera. They 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 knew exactly what it was. But I tell you, I that number one, I was embarrassed when it happened. Well, yeah, it's gotta we be got maddening fixed, knowing that I you're was doing like, it the way you how did we make such a mistake? Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, it was them. It was a disgruntled employee, some volunteer who had been there for 20 years or what, whatever it was. But yeah, that was pretty crazy. Well, thankfully, they actually told you, right? Because I imagine that's one of those things that kind of hate on you for a while. Yeah. How did that happen? (laughs) Well, and that's the thing that goes back to the relationships and the trust we build with our employees that they will come back and or not our employees, our clients yeah. too, that will come back and, and tell us the honest answer on these things. So yeah, wow. I'm still friends with them to this day. And man, that, that was, that threw us for a loop. <laughs> That's awesome though. <laughs> it keep you up some sleep. Yeah. Right. Too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Oh, I hope, awesome. yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you told all your employees too, right? Like, Hey, we didn't screw this yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, you're not the problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry for yelling at you, Greg. It wasn't your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so funny 
<laughs> That's awesome. All right, David. Well, now let's talk about where people can find you. That was an awesome story, by the way. Uh, let people where they, know where they can find you, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, like I said, the interwebs or social media or whatever you guys are utilizing right now. Yeah, we're all over the place. Our website is cbsisandiego.com. We're on all the social platforms, not as much on Twitter, but uh, uh, we do a lot on LinkedIn and uh, uh, um, Facebook and um, Instagram. <clears throat> and then what Sarah and I are doing is the Lead with Coffee. It's mm -hmm. a podcast, which we started just over, well, we started Lead with Coffee over a year ago on a beach in Kona saying, <laughs> we love leadership. We want to teach leadership. We want, we feel God has put it on our hearts to share what we know how do we do this? So we started with this thing called Coffee Talk Tuesday, and it's, you know, short one to five minute video on Facebook and Instagram, just giving an insight or something that we're experiencing on leadership. And this last year um, uh, in March, we launched the podcast. So um, we have a website, leadwithcoffee.com, and you can find the podcast on uh, both Spotify and Apple. And again, we're on all the social platforms. So we want to inspire leaders. We want to show leaders that it doesn't matter what your position or title is. You can lead where you're at. Um, we believe highly in servant leadership and um, love the Servant Leadership Institute and Art Barter here in, in uh, Carlsbad. And so that is us. We want to inspire. We want to help leaders out there grow in whatever business they're in and whatever they're doing. So uh, that's our story. Mm, that's awesome. Love it. Very cool. Love it. Thank you, David. And well, so just, well, just, I want to make one point of clarity real quick before we go. How far out do you guys, do you guys operate? Is it just in San Diego or how far out do you guys go? You know, mostly Southern California. We have projects in um, Riverside and Orange County. I've gone to Houston. I've gone to Las Vegas for uh, Semper Energy and, you know, we'll do those. Um, but, you know, we're going to expand more. Honestly, the Zoom and the teams and what we've had to learn through COVID is what we did in person a lot for move training and move planning. We can do just like this yep. and it works yep. awesome. Figuring it so out. We, to figure it out. We, we've yeah. been working on that and we're, we're going to, yeah, we're going to expand that platform um, because of that. Very cool. Well, thanks again so much for your time. We appreciate it. Um, have a great one and we'll uh, make sure we keep in touch. Yeah. Thanks David. Really. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I appreciate you guys too. Appreciate for the opportunity here and uh, hope we can uh, reach some people. Absolutely. Sounds good. Thanks so much. All right. Have a good one. Hey, thanks for listening. And if you've made it this far, go ahead and give us a like or five stars or whatever means you like us. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss our next episode and check out our website for more video content and extras. While you're there, shoot us a message if you want to be a guest. We'd love to have you on. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.